Welcome, welcome, everybody. This is uh, CSNP Cybersecurity Nonprofit, and we're having our guest here, Otha, and he will be our presenter today. And I'm Kevin Tucker. I wanted to tell you that uh, we're very excited today for this discussion, and uh, hopefully we'll have a little networking session toward the end in the Q&A. And uh, with that being said, what I wanted to do was first give everybody a little breakdown of kind of where our uh, organization is and kind of what we do. Cybersecurity nonprofit, which is a um, global organization, and it is um, a, we provide free security education and resources to make cybersecurity more accessible, inclusive, and diverse. With that being said, we have a lot of programs, events, webinars, um, you name it, trainings, a lot of open source projects, podcasts, there's, there's so much going on. But we will definitely like to have a lot of uh, events coming up in the near, near future. But uh, we were anticipating doing some virtual, you know, some from the virtual space to the physical, but this is just as good in my opinion, as long as you can educate people and, and connect and, and network with folks. But that uh, is important because I think we said before that, you know, it was all, you know, people remember when we could meet in person, but with this is, this is, just, you know, the way it is right now. So, but we do have ch chapters and I'll put this uh, link into our chat, but we do have chapters globally now. I heard pretty big, uh, some pretty big accomplishments and, uh, in our last, uh, I think it was our national meeting, and it was pretty amazing to see the chapters blossoming all over the world, from Africa, Europe, and then all over the U.S. And I'm based out here in Oakland, California, so um, that's where I'm based, but that doesn't stop me from con connecting with our community. And I also wanted to say, if people are looking to get involved, we definitely would love for people to you know, reach out to me and um, whatever chapter is closer to you, if you would like to do that. And you could contact the people in your area to be able to participate. Um, so I'm going to put uh, the link in the chat. There we go. We got our chapter uh, link and we got our volunteer link. And what we'll do is uh, go ahead and get started. And um, I wanted to tell uh, Otha, thank you again for making this uh, opportunity for us to hear from you today. And really, you know, kind of very, very much anticipate, you know, this to be um, a very eye-opening discussion with our audience. And um, what, I, what I do wanna acknowledge too, is that um, cybersecurity, you know, is vast and it's, uh, you know, very, very, um, you know, has a lot of opportunities. So, and, you know, even though people talk about cybersecurity, what is cybersecurity? And so today we're going to discuss some of those things, but the, you know, thing I want to do is introduce Otha. You know, I actually um, know Otha from his, um, some of his speakings he's done, and I attend some of his um, events as well. But with that being said, you know, he's, he's, he's a technical security architect for Cisco Systems, and he specializes in network security architecture to defend against emerging attack trends. So this is the, the, the real deal here. In addition, he provides threat research to organizations to help drive strategic security initiatives to align with business objectives mapped to their security vision. Otha has over 20 years of experience in network implementations, inclusive of routing, switching, and firewalls with an emphasis in security and threat discovery. Prior to joining Cisco, Otha has worked with multiple industries ranging from education, healthcare, manufacturing, and telecommunication. Furthermore, Otha has served as an adjunct professor for graduate and undergraduate courses and continues to teach Linux ethical hacking, forensics, routing and switching classes for underrepresented communities. In addition, he holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Tennessee at Martin, attended the Cecil Humphrey School of Law at the University of Memphis and received an MS in Information Systems from DePaul University. 
uh, the Otha uh, lectures nationally and internationally and is a frequent speaker and panelist as much as more as I was going to say as a friend and a community activist. But I will let him take it over from here and I'm very much excited again. Thank you, Otha, for, for bringing us this today. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for allowing me to um, speak. I had some Windows issues, so I'm hoping all that stuff will um, subside as I continue this talk. But first, just to level set, um, the views and opinions of what you're about to hear are my own. Um, so I want to level set with that. And also to let you know that if you hear something motivational, cool, witty, um, very intellectual stimulating. I can't give my employer the credit for that either. Okay. So all credit, everything is based <laughs> on me. Um, that way I won't get in any trouble if there's something that's offensive. So what I want to talk about is how to make six figures with a GED in cybersecurity. All right. And what I want to do is just talk about particular skill sets that you can acquire as you perfect your craft. And as you perfect your craft, as you go along the security journey, you have the ability to do very well. Now, some of you guys are from Missouri. Some of you guys are from, you know, you're from the show me state and you don't believe that fat meat is greasy. So I want to start, they say, with the end in mind and just show you a glimpse of the corner of happy and health. So Walgreens, and this was done last week, uh, $130,000. And as you see, it says bachelor's degree, four years of experience, and then it jumps to or high school slash GED and at least seven years of IT experience. And the reason why they have the slash seven years, don't really necessarily worry about that. The only thing is, if you know your stuff, if you perfect your craft, then you have no issues because the demand is so high in the security industry that people are willing to take anyone as long as they have perfected their craft and know their stuff. Now you may think Walgreens is just, you know, that was a ad hoc thing, right? But no, use Indeed search, put up GED in cybersecurity, $100,000 plus, right? You get 199 jobs. So it doesn't necessarily matter what location or how you tweak your search engine or your parameters, I want to let you know that the barriers to entry in cybersecurity are so low, as long as you are able to prove that you know what you're talking about. Now, say for example, you've been in trouble with the law, right? And you have a conviction or arrest record, plus your GED or high school diploma or whatever the case may be, people are still willing to hire you so here's a job posting. Cisco would consider for employment on a case-by-case -case basis, qualified applicants with arrest and conviction records, right? Now, I don't mean if you're some serial rapist or sheep or goats or things of that nature, you probably won't get hired. But as long as you are qualified, as long as you have perfected your craft, the entry to your barrier, getting into cybersecurity in the IT industry is pretty low. Now, wait, one more thing. Say, for example, you just fix some flex capacitor. You've gotten 10 patents underneath your belt. You have such a vivid imagination in your creativity that every Fortune 100 or Fortune 10 company is trying to get you to design some new chip. They're not going to ask you, how did you get that? What, are you, how do you, what gets your creative juices going? And the reason why they don't ask that, and you will find that most companies don't do drug testing, is because on a weekend, you could be at the trap house. They have a don't tell, don't ask policy for most organizations because they don't care how you get your creative juices flowing. So once again, your barriers to entry is pretty low as long as you have the habits and the skill set. Now, one thing that we want to show you today is that you never have to worry about that walk of shame. That walk when you packing all your stuff and everybody's wondering, what did he do? I hope he's not living paycheck to paycheck. Maybe he'll land on his feet. You don't have to worry about that, okay? And as you've probably seen certain uh, people present in the past or someplace else talking about careers in cybersecurity, there's a certain theme. There's a certain process that you can think about. And what we want to talk about is that process and tweak it a little bit and cater it toward you and customize it towards how you like to learn. Now, imagine this. The title was, how to make six figures with GED because shift happens. 
See, there's a paradigm shift in cybersecurity and understanding that paradigm shift of how criminals monetize and also learn is critical to your success. Now imagine it's date night and all of a sudden you're sitting there, you're watching TV, you had your significant other, and then this pops up on the screen. Now you're trying to figure out well, what is happening. I was watching a hockey game. I'm not watching a horror movie. Then the timer starts ticking down. A paradigm shift because not only do you have to worry about PCs and servers, you have to worry about IoT devices. So there's a saying, there's a Windows on every desktop and there's an ARM in every pocket. And the ARM means the ARM process of the CPU. So that's what we need to think about. How do you make adjustment in this paradigm shift to stay current? Now, say you graduated from college or you just completed some master's program in information, cybersecurity, risk assessment, blah, blah, blah. You have all the keywords on your resume. You got security plus certification and you find a job for a company called Come By Security. Now you enter for the job, you interview for it, and actually you get the job. So now you get a job on their red team. So you go in to customers, you're doing RFPs, you're a go-getter, so now you get another certification. You're a CEH. With the position of CEH, you become the team lead. That means more money. So you live in a dream. All of a sudden, your mom's watching the news, and she finds out that the company you are working for is actually a front company for the Russian mob. Now, criminalization has changed. No one would imagine somebody setting up a front company, submitting RFPs, RFIs, actually getting work, finding people to actually go out and do work and take the data that they collect from their client engagements as a consultant and selling that on the dark web. We see front companies and laundering money. So this is just something that has happened, how a part of that paradigm shift is changing. Now, this digital disruption is happening all the time, and the criminals know that. So with the cyber crunch of 3.5 million unfulfilled jobs, and that's the old statistics, it may be 4.5, who knows? But the bad guys are counting on people being overworked and underpaid and frustrated. So now mistakes happen. Now we go to Sands and we go to, you know, DePaul or Skyline or whatever to get our training. And we look at that learning curve. We get a virtual environment and we're training. We're doing the best that we can. We're paying $7,000 for SANS or whatever the case may be or some continuing education program. The bad guys use something called Carding University. They pay from $1,000 to $10,000 and they don't get a virtual environment. They get an actual real live environment for a customer. So now they can practice on the Active Directory attacks. They can practice on the lateral movement in a real live environment. And once you get through with the course, they give you job placement in your favorite criminal organization. So this is that paradigm shift of how bad guys are learning. And we need to shift our mentality on how we learn differently as well. Now, everyone has a playbook. Even the bad guys have a playbook. So if you're not aware of the fraud Bible, there's something that's out there. And it's good to get a peek into what the bad guys are doing to give you an idea of how you can prevent them. So if you know how they're attack, then you know a level of prevention that you can prevail. Now, 2015 was the first billion dollar bank heist. And there was something in 2016. And then you didn't hear anything else in 2017, 2018, 2019, it's 2021. So you have to think, did the bad guys just stop? You know, you made a billion dollars one time, what about two and three times? And not only that, but what is the playbook? How much does it cost to learn how to do something like that? So these guys are very methodical and are very patient and very focused. Now, when we think of a cyber criminal or hacker, you know, we think about Mr. Robot, we think about the hacktivist, the nation state, we think about that lone wolf in high school who didn't go to the prom, but this is the cyber criminal now, completely different. So we used to see that James Bond villain, but not necessarily James Bond girl being a criminal mastermind for cybercrime. So it's part of that paradigm shift to actually understand who we are looking after, 
which could be anybody, not the typical you see on a television and being prepared for that. You want to get to the point where you understand this paradigm shift, understand your capabilities and skill sets. So when you get that call on the bat phone, they realize they have the right person and not waiting for the other guy to pick up the phone. Now, how can I help you? So I just want to share some things with you that I've learned in the past um, from my colleagues, from my friends, from my enemies to help you in your journey. So if you only have one job, you got to develop your skill set. You have to develop your skill set to the point that it's Jordanistic, that it's the Kobe Bryant, that's LeBron James, Steph Curry. So now you have to figure out how do I develop my skills? What should I develop and how should I develop it? Now, the key to all this stuff is being passionate about what you're doing because your job is not rewarding financially. It has to be rewarding when it stimulates your mind and you bring out the reality of your head as far as solving a problem. And that is pitting wits against somebody else that understands that you're not playing checkers, but you're playing chess. So there's a few steps being passionate is one, having a library of books, videos on demand, bookmarks, websites, blogs, and the key is learning how to learn new technology quickly. You need to accurately assess yourself and figure out how do you learn? Do you need a structured environment such as a class? Or are you good to just YouTube it and figure it out on your own? Or are you good to learn in a user group environment? So having subscriptions to publications, um, participating in security cons, organizations, and key is building out your lab building out your lab to understand that practice makes perfect and you can use open source tools to do it and then manage your time because you typically may have a nine to five you may be in school you have to deal that work-life balance so time management is key and we'll show you a couple of tricks of the trade for that now there's a lot of jobs in cybersecurity, but everyone's used to the term hacker so we're going to use this term so this is Indeed, I love Indeed because of the fact that they give salary requirements. So I put in Hacker, $130,000, 420 jobs pop up. Now, I just picked three, a top Microsoft security consultant, senior penetration tester, and cybersecurity expert. And what I'm gonna do, I'm going to look at each job description. I'm gonna look at the roles and responsibilities and I'm going to find the common denominator. So the common denominator for two of the jobs are Active Directory. And then we see firewalls. And then after we see the firewalls, we see cloud, AWS, Azure, GCP, right? So these are the things that you need to start working on adding into your utility belt. And then the norms, understanding Windows and Linux and programming, right? So this is just a, the common denominator to figure out what skill set you need to stay or get in the game and also to stay current. So this is something I consistently do even now. I'll go out to a job site, I'll put in keywords and see what's associated with that to understand what I need to do. Now I drink my own Kool-Aid. So, I've, always, uh, I've been dealing with Cisco technology for a very long time before I started working for Cisco. And I got my first job with Cisco technology, routers and switching, and I never even touched one before. I couldn't afford it. eBay wasn't around. You couldn't buy old equipment. The simulated tool was too expensive to buy that they had. So I would just get a book, read my book. I would draw out designs, my network diagrams, and I would just type in notepad what the commands could be, right? So don't let not having access to equipment stop you, particularly when you're talking about building a lab because all you need is a virtual box and two VMs if you're going down that hacker track. Now, if you wanna do compliance, risk assessment, auditing, something different as far as practicing and perfecting that craft, but don't let not having access to equipment uh, become a barrier for you. Another thing that you can do, you can go to the SAN Cybersecurity Skills Roadmap. And this will give you a good idea 
as far as classes to take based upon that specialization. Now, you don't necessarily have to take the class, but if you look at the course objectives of the curriculum, it gives you an idea of what you want to learn or what you need to learn. Now, Linux, Python, PowerShell, you constantly hear that from every security professional that these are good things to learn. The depth that you need to learn them depends upon what you want to do in the industry. Having a book list of, of things is going to be commonplace for you, right? And then the best university is YouTube University. So get you a following of people on YouTube that put out good information and use that information to add on to your skill set. So here's just a few. The Cyber Mentor, Black Hills Information Security is a very good um, channel. The DEF CON, the Black Hat, all of these things. And there's more. I just wanted to highlight a few that I use recently. Now, SANS is relatively expensive. However, if you go to cyberaces.org, they had an agreement, some sort of grant from SANS where they develop a cybersecurity course. And it's very um, intro, beginner, intermediate, where you can go through and learn Linux, Windows, networking, your system administrations. So this is something that you can do SANS quality, but not the SANS price tag. Now, training, you, you should always have your own training budget because your company may not see the need for training. So you wanna be able to invest in yourself. So you wanna find things that are affordable and going to cybersecurity conferences, they definitely have affordable training. And here's one that I like to use, Wild Wise Hack and, Hack and Fest. Some of the courses they give um, zero amount of dollars. You don't have to pay anything, right? Most of the courses cost around 500 bucks. So very good price. And I don't get any royalties from these guys, but they do quality work. And I wanna pass on to you the things that I've learned or the things that I do to keep my skills set up. Now, outside of the Wild West, Hack and Fest, Pentester Academy. I think it's like $30 a month or something for their lab environment and the courses that they do. And they're very good. They just started doing boot camps and they are very affordable. And there's recent technology because sometimes if you go to a school and a university, you learn in technology that's six or seven months behind. You at least want to take a class by people that are actually doing the work, such as Black Hills Information with the Wild Wild Hacking Fest and Pentest Academy, they're always updating their uh, courseware. And you want to follow people on Twitter because sometimes the people on Twitter, they have a good idea or they're the guys that are in the know. They're the guys that teach the sand classes. They're the guys that teach the Black Hat um, training. And what I do, I would go to Black Hat Training USA and look at the instructors, find out they have a Twitter account and I follow them. Then I see who they're following. And there's just a, 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 um, a domino effect. One person leads me to another person. And now I get real time when they come up with something or there's a new exploit, a new tip or trick. I get that in my inbox. And then you want to be able to organize your thoughts. Either OneNote, Evernote, create a YouTube channel, do videos. And you don't even have to um, list your videos if you do it, but some, something, some tutorial to help you remember what you're doing. And then the best thing to organize your thoughts and to remember it is to by teaching as well. And then part of staying current is just Google alerts. So I have Google alerts for malware, hacking, hackers, uh, cybercrime, uh, cybersecurity, security, mobile security, cloud security, whatever you can think of. And now you just have to have fi find time to go through these Google alerts. But this will always help you stay current by getting the latest information that may not necessarily come across the mainstream news. When you are getting ingrained in the cybersecurity industry and you're trying to immerse yourself into it, you wanna understand lateral movements and attack. 
So you want to be able to explain an attack because when you're in that interview, they may ask you, hey, just tell me about an attack. And most attack has some sort of common core foundation, right? Maybe there was a phishing link. And then from that phishing link, then that's when the export started. But you want to be able to give a little bit more detail. So keep in mind, there's a $30,000 answer and a $100,000 answer when you're in a job interview. And based upon the detail or the in-depth that you answer that particular question, that determines your salary range. So you always want to put your best foot forward regarding the questions in an interview. And we'll talk about how to control the interview to actually shine and highlight yourself. So we need to understand that most attacks aren't using Windows environment, they use the camera. I had a customer that got compromised by the return trade machine in the cafeteria. Who would think that the return trade machine in the cafeteria was actually connected to the internet, right? And then once you get in the environment, it's not just pinging anymore, it's using Active Directory or using already resources in the environment to figure out the lay of the land. So this is the mentality or the mindset that you have to have. So we went over a lot of stuff, right? Uh, as far as being involved in organizations, getting your uh, skill set, your books, your bookmarks, your university, your training. But how do you manage all this stuff with work-life balance? So this is just an idea of a schedule, right? And you have to learn or know yourself how you like to learn. So I'm a night owl, so I study at night. I got a friend, multiple friends that are daytime. They want to study at 5 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning, right? So you need to understand that because it's 24 hours in a day. You may be working a full-time job. You may have a family. You may be in school. So how do you divvy that up? And that's the importance of understanding time management. We all remember if we were in college when we used to um, crash, right? We will say, you know what? I'm going to spend the entire night partying and whatnot, and then I'll just crash later. So that's the mentality you have to have, not completely, but being consistent with it because consistency matters, right? So even if you have a schedule and you have your cheat days, that's okay. As long as you're consistent in building up your skill set and building up your foundation. And from that foundation, you can springboard into other areas. Now, you've done all this. Now you have to document and know your value. So irregardless of what the job description says, you have to know your value. You have to think of that roles and responsibilities on that job description as a wish list, like a Christmas wish list. You don't get everything on that Christmas wish list, right? So that's your mentality that you have to have. If you know you can do the job, then you apply for it. When you apply for the job, you can have multiple resumes geared toward different types of employment. Also, when you have your resume, make sure it looks up to date, right? I constantly update my resume every time I learn something new. And your resume needs to look like it's in the ninth, you know, 2020, not 1920 or 1990, right? I get so many resumes and I look at them, I said, man, this is this is horrible, right? So keep that in mind and keep in mind that. Your resume is based upon keyword searches, okay? Now, when you get in that interview, you got to represent. You got to know your digital stuff, and you also have to embrace the stereotypes. Embrace the stereotypes and use it to your advantage. And what I mean by embrace the stereotypes, typically people in IT or cybersecurity, they, not, they may not be the best at um, conveying an idea, right? But that's okay, as long as you know your stuff, as long as you can ask an intelligent question after you stumble upon an answer, they'll say, oh, he knows what he's talking about. Also embrace the fact that most people in the IT and cybersecurity, we all have a common background. We like typically the same things. That's why we're in this industry. Most of us have asked you to raise your hand, you like Star Trek. If you don't like Star Trek, you like Star Wars. Some of you like Star Wars and Star Trek, right? There's a common theme of things that we like. Most people watch The Walking Dead or some zombie movie. So there's things that you can relate to as you get into that interview and establish a bond or rapport with the person who you're going to interview with. Now, when you get in that interview, you have to think about they're lucky to have you because 
the job market is very thin of finding qualified people. So I just did a quick search the other day, network security, 62,000 jobs, cloud security, 84,000 jobs, cyber security, 27,000 jobs, right? So there's a lot of opportunities for you to actually gain employment. If they don't wanna hire you, it's their loss. And you may not wanna work for them anyway once you get into the interview. One of the interview questions I always ask is, what do you guys complain about when you go to lunch? Because if they're complaining about something when they go to lunch, nine times out of 10 or 10 times out of 10, you're going to complain about it as well. And you may not want to work there. So this is what I call you got to bring out the gimp in the interview. When you bring out the gimp in the interview, you have to take control of it. You have to show them that, look, you're lucky to have me. Out of all the candidates that you have, I'm the one. And you bring out the gimp by doing this. The first thing you have to do is research. So this is where OSINT comes in, threat hunting, whatever you call it. But now you want to be able to show that organization that I know your environment. I may not know it 100%, but I know it. So whoever interviews you, when you get that email address, use Have I Been Pawned. Look and see if they're in some sort of data breach. If they're in some sort of data breach, include that in a conversation. Right, you can ask them when you come in. Look, how do you deal with phishing? What are your, um, what do you do for security awareness training? Right, these are the things to kind of show them the idea that you're thinking about their organization. And then after that, we're going to use Shodan. Right, so if you don't not familiar with Shodan, Shodan is like the Google of IoT devices and devices. So just to give you an example, we're going to use Microsoft as a an example, whatever company that you're going to interview with, substitute Microsoft Corporation for the name of the company. So here's organization, then you do title, then you do HTML and host name. Right? You can even do organization Microsoft, right? Whatever the name of the organization and see what comes up. And then as you look and drill down into this information, you get a little bit further. So in this example, somebody's using a, a 2008 server with SMB, Service Pack 1. So you incorporate that in your conversation. So an example would be, um, what do you guys use for an EDR, for endpoint protection? Because I've noticed that you have a lot of old servers, Windows 2008, and servers running SMB version 1 and Service Pack 1. How do you deal or threat hunt that environment for those Windows servers? So now you just prove that you understand the concepts, that you know they have 2008. They know that you know what an EDR because you asked about it. They have a feel that you know about threat hunting because you asked about it. They understand that you know what SMB does because you asked about it. So that shows your intelligence based upon the type of question that you ask. So even if they ask you a question and you fumble over it, at the end of every interview, they're gonna always ask you, do you have questions for us? And that's when you rise and shine. In addition to that, openbugbounty.org. Put in the name of the company and see if they have any cross-site scripting. So this is what it looks like. So you can also say, you know what? I noticed that your web portal has an unpatched cross-site scripting since 2017. What is the relationship between the developers and the networking team and the security team? Right, good question. And so now they understand, okay, he understands cross-site scripting because he asked about it. And we didn't know that we even had that. As you continue bringing out the GIMP, one of my best tools that I like to use is called Spiderfoot. I use Spiderfoot to give you a glimpse of what it looks like. I just look for leaks, dumps, and breaches. And you can look for other stuff. You just put the name of the domain that you want to look at or the organization and let it run. And you get a nice report, can, where you can use that to establish or understand your, go down the path of your threat hunting. And then your Google Kung Fu, right? So the Google operators and the Google dorks, sometimes you don't, you, you don't remember them all. So this particular website will help you um, finding those Google dorks because they're already pre-populated. So they pre-populated, all you have to do is put in the name of the domain 
And guess what? You can find database leaks. You can find paste bin. You can find logins, backup, anything that you can think of. Well, anything that's listed here. And it gives you an idea of the syntax. And then once you have the syntax, you can start tweaking the syntax as well to get further results. And then if you want to be a little bit more in detail, you can go to Expo DB and start drilling down their Google Docs. All right. So everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? And that punch in the face is just work-life balance and things that are happening that you have no control of. But if you have some sort of time management, some sort of management of your life as you go down this journey, it makes it a little bit easier. Now, the only thing I can say, um, this quote that I love is that the only thing standing between you and your goal is the bullshit story you keep telling yourself as to why you can't achieve it, right? Some people say, I'm too old. I don't know enough. You have that imposter syndrome. It doesn't even matter. The cybersecurity industry need people so bad. Right? I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, the FBI, they started to um, cut down on the requirements to join the FBI because to join the FBI, you gotta run. You gotta do a bunch of sit-ups and put-ups. And guess what? Most IT guys, they don't wanna do a hundred push-ups or sit-ups or run a mile or two miles. They may want to shoot a gun, but that's it. So that just shows you that um, you have the, the cards in your hand because you're in the skill set that as long as you perfect it, that is in high demand. All you have to do is trust the process, follow the process, and go down your journey. Okay, so it doesn't matter how you get there. It doesn't matter how long it gets there, but I've given you some tips and tricks that will help you uh, shorten that learning curve. And that's the key. How do you shorten that learning curve where I don't want to go necessarily and take a four year degree just to get in the cybersecurity industry. You want to be able to do something in six months, 12 months, right? Shorting that learning curve. And you can do that as long as you take an accurate assessment of your skill set and chart and plan it out. Any questions? Thank you, Ota. That was phenomenal. Um, we'll take questions now from our audience. Please raise your hand, hopefully, and we'll get to you. Thank you. 